Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to this lecture, distinguished lecture in international affairs sponsored by the Wheatley Institution and the David M. Kennedy Center for uh, International uh, Studies, International Studies, Jeff, did I get that right? Okay, thank you. We're pleased to have with us tonight uh, Douglas Johnston, who's founder and president of the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy, who will be our distinguished lecturer. I've asked uh, Jeff Ringer, director of the David M. Kennedy Center, to offer uh, an opening prayer, as is our custom. And then um, uh, Dr. Amos Jordan, who is senior fellow in international relations at the Wheatley Institution, will introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Johnson. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful to be here this evening and grateful for the good work that the Wheatley Institution does in highlighting important global affairs here on campus. We're especially grateful for the visit of Dr. Johnson tonight. We ask that thy blessings be with him as he delivers his message and be with us as we gather tonight in, a, in an attitude of learning. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce to you a colleague, I shouldn't say a friend of old, uh, a long-standing friend with whom uh, I've shared many experiences in the Office of the Secretary of Defense and particularly at the Center for Strategic and International Studies where he's been a great bulwark for a whole dozen years as the Chief Operating Officer. Doug has an unusually rich background to address this subject tonight as a nuclear submariner, the youngest uh, submarine captain in the nuclear fleet to command a nuclear sub, and 10 years veteran of that service, and then government service in the Office of Emergency Preparedness and the Secretary of Defense and the Department of Navy. He's a very strong background in global security and in the general subject of international diplomacy. But he also has a strong background in faith, being himself a man of faith and being very much involved in the, in the National Prayer Breakfast and uh, having authored an extraordinary volume which is Religion, the, mission, the Missing Dimension of Statecraft which is now in its 15th edition with the Oxford University Press. Subsequently, he's uh, written two other books dealing with this subject, and I think we would be hard pressed in the United States to find anyone who can speak with such depth of knowledge and rich experience on this topic as Doug Johnston, and we welcome you to BYU, Doug. Thank you, Joe. It's a real privilege to be with you today. I had a brief uh, tour of the campus before uh, this evening's ceremony and was mightily impressed. I've been uh, very familiar with uh, BYU's prowess on the football field for some time, but uh, this, was, uh, this was a real treat. And it's an honor to be here, and it's an honor, a particular honor for me to be introduced by Joe Jordan, who I consider to be one of the finest human beings on the face of the planet. Anyone who doesn't know him should. Uh, it's, it's a real treat. He's tremendous. What I would like to do this evening is to uh, sort of demonstrate to you how our own religious heritage uh, can be an asset in this uh, world in which we find religious imperatives uh, all over the geopolitical landscape. You know, for more than a dozen years now, defense planners at the Pentagon have been wrestling with what they call the asymmetric threat. The term asymmetric, as it suggests, means lack of symmetry. And what it means in uh, this situation is an attack by creative, unconventional means 
by a disadvantaged opponent against a more powerful adversary in order to try to level the field of conflict. Um, this is exactly what bin Laden used to rock this nation back on its heels. This is what suicide bombers are all about. These are asymmetric threats. Well, in response to this, the Pentagon has come up with a new concept called irregular warfare, which calls for much tighter coordination between diplomacy, defense, and development. All to the good, but I submit to you that uh, even before the recent economic crisis, uh, this country has never had enough money in the U.S. Treasury to protect all of us from the full spectrum of possible asymmetric threats. And what's really needed is an asymmetric counter, one that deals, gets at the ideas behind the guns. Um, that may sound straightforward and simple, but it's made complicated by the religious nature of those ideas. And as has been abundantly clear from our experiences, recent experiences, involvements in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, we have very little ability to deal with religious differences in a hostile setting, nor do we have any ability to counter demagogues like bin Laden or before him Milosevic who manipulate uh, religion for their own purposes. Among the reasons, uh, several stand out. First is we've uh, unfortunately used our separation of church and state. We've let it become a crutch for not doing our homework to understand how religion informs the world views and political aspirations of those who do not similarly separate the two. Second is our long-held commitment to the rational actor model of decision making in which religion was deemed to be ir irrational and therefore outside the policymaker's calculus. In short, we simply don't know how to deal with it. And the third reason is uh, because of the separation of church and state, we've so compartmentalized religion in our lives that uh, whenever industry or government hears the word, they sort of head for the hills for fear that they'll be accused of favoring one tradition over another. And uh, we then transplant that mindset to, on an extraterritorial basis, overseas. And we find ourselves operating with one hand behind our back because of the, the ambiguities, the legal ambiguities of the church-state separation. And uh, General David Petraeus, who's, uh, you're, who you're going to hear from in a few months, stands out as someone who has not been intimidated by that at all and understands clearly that uh, if you have a secular purpose and there's a national security dimension, there is a lot of room to run. Well, if you add to uh, those reasons, this looming specter of religious extremism married to weapons of mass destruction, it only makes more urgent the need to fill this gap. Now, one approach that has uh, shown unusual promise in, be able to, in being able to do something like this, bridging the gap, is a new form of engagement called faith-based diplomacy. Now, what is that? Well, at the macro level, it simply means incorporating religious considerations into the practice of international politics. At the micro level, it means actually making religion part of the solution in some of these intractable identity-based conflicts that exceed the grasp of traditional diplomacy. By identity-based conflicts, I mean uh, ethnic disputes, uh, religious hostilities, tribal warfare, this sort of thing. And if you want to get into uh, some depth what this faith-based diplomacy is all about. There is a book that is a sequel to the book that Joe mentioned. Uh, he spoke of religion, the missing dimension of statecraft, which came out in 1994 by Oxford University Press. Uh, and uh, its successor, which came out in 2003, called Faith-Based Diplomacy, Trumping Realpolitik. And it goes uh, into some depth on what this is all about. But collectively, what these two books are about is ex exploring the positive role that religious or spiritual factors can play 
in uh, actually preventing or resolving conflict, while at the same time advancing social change based on justice and reconciliation. So it's not peace for peace sake, it's peace for justice sake. Now, ever since our center's inception in 1999, uh, we've been practicing faith-based diplomacy in different parts of the world, beginning in Sudan. Uh, there, that was our first experience. There were a, a number of NGOs, non-governmental organizations like ourselves, involved in Sudan, but they were all in the south. And they were dealing with the trying to relieve the suffering associated with the conflict that was taking place and doing as good a job as one could hope. Uh, we chose, on the other hand, to go to the north. We wanted to get at cause. And uh, the purpose was to actually set out to establish relationships of trust with the Islamic regime. And from that vantage point, inspire them to take steps toward peace they wouldn't otherwise take because of this, you know, there was a long-standing civil war that was taking place, uh, I think, 16 years at that point, between the Islamic North and the uh, Christian and African traditionalist South. So we wanted to see if we could help bring that to a halt. Um, we were able to make some headway there, and among other things, we were able to establish an interreligious council, uh, and under its auspices, a committee to protect religious freedom. And this council, is a council that meets monthly, involves the top Christian and Muslim religious leaders who come together, service, and try to resolve their problems. Um, and they also hold the government accountable for its religious policies. Uh, now what's rather remarkable about this, and, and all of these things I'm going to tell you about, we can go into more detail uh, in the question and answer period, but as far as uh, this one goes, this took place in the context of an Islamic dictatorship. Uh, the formation of an independent body holding that dictatorship, if you will, accountable for its religious policies. Uh, not only did they agree with that, the regime, uh, but they, uh, they also agreed to leadership for that council that they were strongly opposed to. It took me five months of working that problem to get this person uh, in place. Uh, it was a Muslim. He had been in the forefront of the Islamic movement in Sudan, but uh, had been very critical of the current regime when they seized power in a coup in 1989. He said that was not the right way to seize power, so he became a critic and has a weekly column in the Sudanese newspapers and Qatar, and uh, often criticized the regime. So he was, had been a real thorn in their side, but he'd also been the political science professor of uh, half of the cabinet, so there was a love-hate relationship. Once he was in place, uh, they quickly, just in the first several months of its existence, they had achieved more in the way of concrete measures to help non-Muslims than the churches had been able to do operating on their own for the previous 10 years. So it was, uh, and, and they also, furthermore, the, the government agreed to take seriously the recommendations of the council. And Darfur notwithstanding, which is a Muslim on Muslims uh, conflict, they have honored that uh, agreement to the tune of more than a half a million dollars in the form of land and uh, money to build new churches. There had not been a new church built in Khartoum in the previous 25 years. Uh, and also to provide restitution for the past seizure of the church properties. So uh, this is sort of where we were in Sudan. But meanwhile, back in Washington, we were working behind the scenes to get the Bush administration engaged in trying to force both sides to the peace table. And uh, that actually paid off as well. So collectively all these things came together and by no means were we solely responsible for anything, but we did play a part. Uh, secondly, uh, we got involved in the Kashmir. That's the only place we've been involved uh, that we weren't invited in. And we were there purely because uh, I saw it to be the leading nuclear flashpoint in the world at the time, and nobody was doing anything. So we maneuvered our way in, and we could not try a top-down strategy as we had in Sudan, because there was real political gridlock at the top. In fact, there are some who could make a pretty convincing case that neither India nor Pakistan really wants to resolve the Kashmir problem, because it becomes a convenient escape valve when 
you have domestic problems, you just turn up the gain on cashmere and it takes people's mind off the domestic problems. Um, so what we did was we engaged uh, emerging young leaders uh, of the next generation. Uh, these were uh, not as young as that might sound. These were community leaders, these were professors, uh, journalists, lawyers, you name it. And uh, trying to create a spirit of cooperation between the Hindu, Muslim, and uh, Buddhist regions of that troubled state and have uh, pretty much succeeded in doing that. And right now we're trying to figure out exactly how the track one uh, peace process between India and Pakistan can seize upon the goodwill that's been created at this level. Thirdly, uh, we got involved in Pakistan, and I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, we also uh, got involved in Iran. Uh, there, I had the pleasure of being part of an Abrahamic delegation that visited Iran in 2003 under the leadership of Cardinal Ted McCarrick, who was Archbishop of Washington. It was Abrahamic in that it in, uh, included Christians, uh, Muslims, and Jews. And we went over and met with uh, most of the hierarchy, all the Grand Ayatollahs, uh, the head of the Supreme Court, the Parliament, the uh, President, these sorts of things. Uh, established some relationships, tried to start building some trust. I must tell you, if you ever have occasion to visit Iran, do it. It is an incredibly impressive country, particularly the, this cultural legacy of the Persian Empire. It's just awesome, and every, every, every Iranian is a would-be poet at heart. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a country. But um, then two years later, I raised the funds to uh, sponsor a reciprocal visit over here. It too was Abrahamic, it too was nine in number, and it too was for 10 days. It was exact reciprocity. One of the highlights of that, I remember, was uh, sitting down the nine members of that delegation with eight very well-informed congressmen, and they had added on all the hot-button issues, and at one point, uh, uh, one of the congressmen pointed to the, leading, the Ayatollah who was leading the group and he said, tell me, he said, uh, do you believe Israel has a right to exist? And the Ayatollah leaned back in his chair and chuckled a little bit and said, uh, of course Israel has a right to exist, just as we have the right not to recognize it. So <laughs> this, this was the level of repartee. And, uh, and I must say that if I were trying to grade the two sides, I would probably have to have given the uh, the, the better grade to the Iranians only because we get caught up in our uh, our double standards. You know, we come down on them very heavily on the nuclear question and, and turn a blind eye to Israel. Uh, we come down very heavily, as happened in that uh, that meeting, on their treatment of religious minorities, and we turn a blind eye to Saudi Arabia, where it's ten thousand times worse. And in fact, Iran is the only country and that whole region that protects uh, minority religions in its constitution, specifically naming uh, Christians, Jews, and Zoroastrians, not Baha'is, because Baha'is are thought to be a heretical sect, and they suffer mightily as a result of that. But uh, I spoke with the Jewish member of parliament who was uh, uh, there along with a um, uh, Christian archbishop, and they both commented on how just that year out of the president's budget, they were receiving a million dollars uh, to repair uh, churches and synagogues and what have you. And that the following year, it was going to go up to two million coming from the parliament, and that would be that on a, day, on a yearly basis. So uh, their treatment of minority religions uh, wasn't, uh, it's not quite as bad as uh, it's made out to be. Uh, after that visit, I thought, well, you know, this business of building relationships and trust is all well and good. I believe in it. But I don't think it's going to get us as far as we need to be as quickly as we need to be there in light of the nuclear question. So it caused me to ask myself, what, what might we do to short circuit that? And I had played in a war game uh, relating to Iran a couple of years earlier. And it got me to wondering what might a peace game look like and uh, develop that concept where you would bring high level figures from both the both sides together who are not in government, who are known to be spiritually minded, uh, but even though they're not in government, they're too respected to be ignored by their governments. So we're talking about very 
high class individuals who had come together and, and for a week under the auspices of a world class facilitator try to figure out how to overcome the obstacles standing in the way of a cooperative relationship. And um, I talked with uh, uh, an old colleague from Harvard days, uh, Roger Fisher, who wrote the book Getting to Yes, uh, the whole win-win concept which he developed. And he had agreed to uh, be the facilitator. And when I uh, approached this idea with the Iranian ambassador of the United Nations, uh, he got very enthused about it because he read Fisher's book. And uh, at this time, this was before Ahmadinejad was elected, and um, they, everybody thought that Rafsanjani was going to be the, uh, the one who would prevail. And, he, and I told him, I said, look, rather than do this in a neutral location, I prefer to do it in Iran, because I think it would provide greater incentive for the Americans to participate. And furthermore, it would convey a note of humility that's all too absent from US foreign policy these days doing uh, this kind of an exercise in their territory. And he said, well, if Rafsanjani wins, you can do it in Iran. He said, anyone else will probably have to be Europe. Well, when Ahmadinejad won, all bets were off. And no one, uh, least of all this ambassador, knew where they stood. So we sort of froze the problem. Uh, but uh, just recently, when uh, President Ahmadinejad was back for the the meeting of the United Nations. Um, I was able to get his concurrence on uh, his support for uh, engaging in such an exercise. So now we're uh, hard, hard and heavy at trying to develop that and uh, make it happen. So that's Iran. Um, and the next one really was had to do with the United States. And there is so work with the American Muslim community. And the idea is, uh, I'm just convinced that uh, of all the assets we have in our disposal for this contest with uh, militant Islam, that the American Muslim community is our greatest strategic asset. And not only had it not been recognized as such, but we were unwittingly alienating it over time. So in 2006, we convened a conference of 30 American Muslim leaders and 30 U.S. government officials to try to bring them together to see how they could start working together for the common good. And in the process, to try to capitalize on the extensive paths of influence that the American Muslim community has with Muslim communities overseas, um, it, many of them in, in areas of great strategic consequence to us. Secondly, how to inform US foreign policy with a uh, Muslim perspective foreign policy and public diplomacy. Because when we were in the bipolar confrontation, we used to red team everything. We'd put on the Soviet hat, try to figure out how they were going to react to whatever we were going to do. And we've not been doing that uh, with this threat. And finally, how to, how to help the American Muslim community uh, take a strong leadership role in the further intellectual and spiritual development of Islam. And when I try that notion out on Muslims overseas, there's a great reception to that. They feel like the sun of Islam is going to rise in the West. And that's because the American Muslim community has greater freedom of thought than just about any other Muslim community out there. And also on a daily basis, they're, they're living out uh, the, this brid bridging the gap between modernity and the contemporary practice of Islam. So uh, we had that conference, it went well. We had a follow the following year, we had another conference to follow up on the recommendations of the first and to go into some new areas. And uh, some good things are really coming out of this. The Muslims have formed a, a group, an advisory group called American Muslims for Constructive Engagement. Uh, and uh, they're actively uh, taking initiatives to try to uh, provide Muslim insights on different foreign policy problems. The doors at the departments of justice, homeland security, state and defense have opened wider to the inputs of American Muslims. So that's going in a good direction. Uh, next area is uh, Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, we're uh, bringing political and religious leaders from, together from all the provinces of, of Afghanistan 
to come together and to see how they can start, uh, we can elicit their cooperation in development assistance. And why that's so strategic is because the, the political leaders uh, have their agenda and they get listened to. But the religious leaders who used to get listened to a lot under the Taliban government have been marginalized. And they are the lifeblood of the Taliban, which is actively out there sabotaging development assistance. So it's, uh, so far we've had three regional conferences leading up to, a, uh, there will be two more of those leading up to a major one where we think we'll have some real breakthroughs in this area. Um, Middle East, we're doing something that's quite different there. We're bringing American evangelicals together with uh, uh, Muslim clerics. We put them through a process that we call faith-based uh, reconciliation seminars. It was about three, three and a half days long. Uh, but they cause people to have to go very deep about their own attitudes and perspectives. Um, we try to bring the transcendent aspects of their personal religious faith to bear in overcoming the secular obstacles to peace. And although we never proselytize, we do tell them that what we're teaching them are the reconciling principles of Jesus. And uh, forgiveness looms large in that, as you might imagine. And I've uh, yet to see one of these seminars not end with uh, people in tears, embracing, uh, and I'm talking about people who were pretty tough uh, adversaries before. You can't do it immediately uh, with the adversaries. You have to start with each group with the moderates and then you build up to more militants and you do it on both sides and then you bring them together. And so the idea here is once we achieve a spirit of reconciliation between these selected clerics and, uh, and uh, Christian pastors and the like, uh, then we're going to segue in Jewish religious leaders. And once we have achieved some reconciliation across all three groups, then their goal is to try to establish a religious framework for peace upon which political leaders can build. See, this is the peace that's always been missing in our Middle East peace process in the past. Religious leaders have never been at the table. Why it's a good idea to have them at the table is, first of all, they bring a moral authority. It's not there otherwise. They also uh, enable you to deal with religious issues. For example, a lot of people were very puzzled why Arafat uh, would not respond to Ehud Barak's seemingly generous offer some time ago. And uh, the reason is, is that Arafat was not empowered by Islam to speak on matters of great consequence like the final disposition of Jerusalem. Uh, and he felt that he would probably be killed and he probably would have been. But the more important reason is if you, whatever political settlement emerges, if you want it to be lasting in nature, your religious leaders must feel some ownership in that process. Because of their unrivaled influence at the grassroots level, they can make you or they can break you. And uh, so that's why that one's important. Now, I'd like to speak to you, uh, those were just once over lightlies, but I'd like to speak to you in a little bit of depth about uh, Pakistan. I've been on the ground there for five years. Um, in Pakistan, we've been on the ground for five years uh, reforming the madrasas. These are the religious schools that gave birth to the Taliban, among other things. Now, these religious schools uh, have quite a glorious history, which very few people seem to be aware of. But back in the Middle Ages to the 16th century, they were unrivaled as uh, institutions of higher learning in the world at the time. It was only European exposure to them that led to the creation of our university system, of which you are a part. And uh, so many things that we uh, take as, as givens now, uh, we have no idea that they emanated from the madrasas. About a half a year ago, I was presented with an honorary doctorate at a seminary in New York, and I was able to tell them, I said, you know, the, these mortar boards and tassels that we're wearing today, those came out of the madrasas. Uh, the concept of funding a chair in a given discipline came out of the madrasas. But unfortunately, over time, particularly under the influence of colonialism, 
They sought to, uh, as a reaction against colonialism, they purged themselves of all subjects that they considered to be at all secular in nature or anything that could be identified with the West. To the point where today what you have is the majority of these madrasas are about rote memorization of the Quran and the study of Islamic principles. Well, um, our goals there have been twofold. First, to expand the curriculums, to uh, include the physical and social sciences, with a very strong emphasis on human rights, particularly women's rights, and religious tolerance. We don't pretend to touch the religious core, but our assumption is if we can do a very good job on those two counts, that we can smooth a lot of the rough edges, and the results uh, seem to be bearing that out. The second goal, which I think is probably even more important, is to transform the pedagogy, to create critical thinking skills among the youth. What happens now is you'll have a youngster as young as the age of 12 who's memorized the Quran from cover to cover, and for that he gets an honorary title in front of his name, Hafiz, which he carries for life, and that means good things for him and his family in the afterlife. It's uh, very respected. Um, but he doesn't have a clue of what he's memorized, what it means. He's memorizing it in Arabic. His first language is Urdu. And these youngsters are not given near enough Arabic to understand th something as sophisticated as the Quran. And everyone I've talked to who's been through a madrasa who speaks English will tell you they didn't they had no idea what it meant. But along comes a local militant who misappropriates a little scripture, as all religions are guilty of doing from time to time. And these youngsters have no ability uh, to question or to challenge. They just get recruited and away they go. Most of them uh, who are in the madrasas, at least uh, about 88% of them are from the, the poorest of the poor. And they feel like they owe their lives to the madrasas because they get room, they get bored, and they get education. And uh, uh, otherwise they might not have gotten any of that. So uh, it's, it's quite a, uh, an allegiance that they carry with them. Now, we've, uh, we've been pretty successful at this. At this point we've uh, been involved with some uh, 2,200 madrasa leaders from 1,500 different madrasas. Um, and this stands in marked contrast to the past failed attempts of the government of Pakistan. And the reasons for our success are threefold. First, we're doing it in such a way that they feel it's their reform effort. It means they have a lot of ownership in the process. And quite apart from the negative stereotypes that you read about, a lot of very bright people there and they come up with good ideas. Sometimes it's as simple as we show them good things and they ask for more. Secondly, we inspire them with their own heritage, not only the heritage of their institutions, but going back further in time, uh, when under Islam a thousand years ago, you had these pioneering breakthroughs in the arts and sciences, including religious tolerance, took place under Islam. And the more they hear that, the more they internalize it, the taller they walk, the more they start thinking, hey, maybe we can do better. And thirdly, probably most important of all, is we ground all suggested change in Islamic principles so that they can feel that uh, as they're affecting this change, they're becoming better Muslims in the process. And they are. Uh, while the numbers I gave you uh, sound impressive, this is a little out of date. You know, the numbers are, are larger than that. It's really only the tip of the iceberg because there's somewhere between 20 and 25,000 of these religious schools. Not even the government of Pakistan can tell you how many. But because most of them that we've dealt with have been in the, most, the more radical areas, uh, we feel that we now have uh, completed the heart, winning the hearts and minds phase and that we're ready to take this to scale. And I'll tell you what that, uh, what's involved in that in just a moment. Uh, what I'd like to do now is share with you a few anecdotes about uh, how this faith-based diplomacy works and, and what it can do for you. About two years ago, I took two board members with me to Pakistan to visit several madrasas that had been clearly identified with terrorism. We had not had any programs in those madrasas, but we were able to get 
uh, have entree based on uh, what we'd been, the work we'd been doing with other madrasas and the credibility that came with that. So we walked into this first one, it was a Dio Bandi madrasa. There's five sects that sponsor these religious schools. Uh, the Wahhabis and the Dio Bandis are the two hardest line, but the Dio Bandi, which the Taliban came from, is far more powerful and influential than all of the other four, other, four put together. So we visited this one outside of Karachi. It's called the Benori, Benori town. Uh, we're talking about 7,000 students. And uh, went, walked into this room, and the room was filled with rage. I mean, it was filled with uh, madrasa leaders, administrators, uh, Islamic scholars, and the like. But it was very clear that the, these, these were not happy people. Uh, it was filled with rage because of US foreign policy. It was also filled with rage because of the uh, Lebanon crisis that was going on at the time where Israel and Hezbollah were uh, hard at it. And of course, everything Israel does, the uh, United States gets blamed for. So we started out by saying, you know, we're not a government organization, nor have we ever received funding from our government. And while the United States may have made some mistakes of late, it's important for you to remember when they intervened on behalf of Muslims in Bosnia, Kosovo, Somalia, Kuwait. I said, left, it must, left untold in most recitations of Somalia are the more than 100,000 Somali lives that were saved as a result of the humanitarian aspects of that intervention. And I said, and while the United States may uh, uh, f be fairly accused of operating with a double standard in the Middle East because of our strategic relationship with Israel, I said, so too can you accuse the Arab leaders of doing the same thing, who complain mightily of Israeli mistreatment, but then turn a deaf ear to Palestinian pleas for humanitarian assistance. So I said, everywhere you look, there's double standards driven by perceived national self-interest. And uh, so what I was trying to do is get past the rage. But then I said, you know, we're not here to talk about this, though. We're here to talk about religious values that we share in common. And then I uh, quoted several passages from the Quran that I had committed to memory, a poor paraphrase of which is, oh, mankind, God, have, God would have made you could have made you one had he willed, but he did not. Instead, he made you into separate nations and tribes that you may know one another, cooperate with one another, and compete with one another in good works. I said, I and my two colleagues are here to open the competition in good works. I said, the three of us happen to be followers of Jesus. I said, uh, you can't, we know you can't be a good Muslim unless you believe some pretty wonderful things about Jesus, which is very true. We could go into that in great depth in the question and answer period. I said, so let's ask ourselves, if he were here standing in our midst today, how would he want us to behave toward one another? And by the time that discussion played out over the next hour, at the end, that rage had really been converted to a spirit of acceptance uh, bordering on fellowship. It was uh, rather remarkable. We went up, then went to a madrasa near Lahore, which had been identified with the London bombers. Same routine, same impact. And uh, since then, the leader of that madrasa, who is a rather large, uh, widely revered, somewhat feared individual, has uh, uh, encountered our project director several occasions. And each occasion, he has made reference to the question I asked about Jesus, and he said, it's caused me to ask myself on a daily basis, what would the prophet have me do? And his uh, madrasa, which has not had the benefit of our workshops at all, is uh, convening on a, a regular basis seminars on peacemaking and conflict resolution. So you never, you never quite know where these uh, seeds are, that you plant are going to lead. Uh, and another one, after it was over, a madrasa leader came up to me with his hand over his heart, smile in his eyes, smile on his face. He says, you've made me so very, very happy. He said, uh, we thought all Americans hated us. I thought to myself, well, if you took the media as your guidepost, you, probably, you would come to that conclusion. But uh, I assured him that uh, not all Americans did hate him. Another one came up and said, 
you know, there's a situation in my village that uh, I ordinarily would not uh, get involved with. But apparently a young lady had been caught talking on her cell phone at two in the morning uh, with a young man in another village in whom she had an interest. And uh, the village elders felt that this broke, this violated their honor code. So she was to die and the boy was to lose his nose and his ears. And this madrasa leader said, you know, uh, this go happens all the time, but I feel led because of our discussions on human rights to go back and confront this on religious grounds. So he did, and not without some trepidation because he's a relatively young man. But he sat down with the village elders, showed them how there was nothing in the, pro the Quran that prohibited a woman from talking to a man. And uh, he urged the, he emphasized the passages that uh, urged the peaceful resolution of differences, and he pulled it off. No one was hurt. And hopefully, uh, you know, the matter was resolved, and hopefully that can serve as a precedent uh, in that village and perhaps others in the years to come. But this was a situation where religion trumped tribalism in a context where not even most Muslims can tell you where one ends and the other begins. And it's not always a given that religion is going to trump because as they will point out to you, our tribal customs date back 3,000 years. Islam only goes back 1,400 years. So uh, you still have to work at it. In another uh, situation, getting to the business of uh, displacing ideas behind the guns, we're doing a workshop up in uh, the Punjab, it was a major Al-Qaeda feeder. About 22% of their graduates go into Al-Qaeda, but rather than going to Afghanistan to fight Americans because of their geography, they go to Kashmir to be part of the militant movement. And towards the end of uh, the session, uh, one of them asked, uh, is waging jihad in Kashmir sanctioned by Islam? And our project director said, uh, no, it isn't, but I'm not a religious leader. So he turned to our Wahhabi indigenous partner who enjoys the least honorary mullah status. And he got up and he said, no, it's only, uh, it's only uh, justified to defend the religion, never to acquire territory. So this led to a rather intense debate between the madrasa leaders that were present. And uh, they came up with a consensus conclusion that the fighting in Kashmir was politically motivated but not religiously sanctioned. So they're trying to see now how they can tone down the militancy of their graduates. And I was surprised to learn uh, three visits ago to Pakistan. While I was there, I learned that that episode had been carried in a newspaper in Balochistan, which was quite some distance away. This, by the way, is uh, uh, one of the group of workshop, these are madrasa leaders who've just completed the workshop and getting their certificates. Uh, this is our project director. At the bottom it says, uh, an American hero. Uh, he really is. Uh, this gent, uh, his name is Azar Hussein, or Ozzy as we call him. But he, uh, when I met him, he was a trainer at AARP of all places. Uh, but he's one of the, he's a Pakistani American. He attended a madrasa himself. Um, he's probably one of the most effective trainers I've ever seen, ever. Uh, he displays incredible wisdom in dealing with the mindsets over there. And on top of that, he's one of the most likable people you'll ever meet in your life. So that combination has been like a hot knife cutting through butter. But why he's a real American hero is not only does he bear the burden of, of being an American, but he's also Shia. And the places we've gone, they do unspeakable things to Shia and uh, he's been able to carry it off in every situation. So he's uh, owed a great debt for how far he's brought us. This is a, this is a picture, the gent in the middle is our uh, Diobandi indigenous partner. Uh, it's this Wahhabi and, in, and Diobandi indigenous partners that get us into these very radical areas and enable us to do the work. Um, he is of particular significance because, well, let me back up a little bit. At one of our workshops, we found that one of the participants, and these are the partners who bring the people together, 
was a Taliban commander of some renown. We were surprised. Though he was renowned, he was also despondent. He lost two sons in the fighting. And he said uh, that, uh, you know, we don't know what America wants. You come after us with guns, and we've got no, uh, uh, no alternative other than to respond in kind. So this led to an invitation for me to come to the mountains to speak to the senior leadership about what America wants, which I did two months later. And in the meantime, I did my due diligence at state and defense to make sure that whatever I said was consistent with uh, U.S. policy. And I'm here to tell you that the Taliban commanders in the mountains of Afghanistan are not the only ones who don't know what America wants. But uh, anyway, uh, so I met with them up in a compound of a gentleman who apparently uh, had given san sanctuary to bin Laden right after 9-11. I'm there with 57 Taliban commanders and some religious leaders and tribal leaders and uh, talk about how uh, we wanted to see if, based on our common religious values, if we could create a confidence building measure that could point toward peace, but for them to uh, be able to do that, they needed to understand the Western perspective on what was going on. So I told them what America wanted, which was for the uh, Taliban to uh, put down their guns, distance themselves from Al Qaeda, and reconcile with the Karzai government. And over the course of the next two hours of venting and all sorts of things, there were about five key questions that emerged. The first one of which was, what do the American people want? And I breathed a sigh of relief there because that meant they were still cutting us some slack, even though we had reelected the administration that, that was causing them their problems. And I told them that uh, what Americans wanted was uh, to uh, want a peace in the region with democratically stable governments in Iraq and Afghanistan. Then they wanted to know why we're attacking Islam. I assured them we weren't for the reasons I gave you before. Uh, wanted to know why we're attacking Afghanistan. And I said, well, putting it in terms that are important to you, uh, hospitality, loyalty, and revenge, I said, before we recognize certain members of Al-Qaeda as a threat, um, we welcome them into our country. And uh, then without warning, they struck. So we wanted revenge. So we asked the Taliban government to turn over the Al-Qaeda leadership so we could pull them, bring them to justice. They refused, so we attacked. But I said, we did so with a heavy heart because most Americans have great admiration and respect for the Afghan people stemming from our common struggle against the former Soviet Union. And I said, furthermore, it's important for you to recognize some of your tribal leaders are now banding together against them because they violated your hospitality. And then they wanted to know uh, why we attacked Iraq and uh, why we supported Israel. And uh, I gave them uh, answers that I don't need to take time with right at the moment. Uh, but uh, we then broke for prayer, came back in a smaller group, and, and conceived a confidence-building measure, which called for uh, establishing a secure zone in the western third of Nuristan, which was the Afghan province right across from the Malakan Agency where we were meeting in Pakistan. And, uh, oops. I don't know why it's not coming up. I'm just going to show you a map. But in any event, um, the Taliban, it was very clear. They, they seemed to care a lot about their people. Uh, they hated the warlords. Uh, they felt that the warlords co-opted the U.S. military at times. But they also had uh, total disdain for Karzai because he had not uh, kept his promise to get the warlords under control. So establishing a, a secure zone in the western third of Nuristan was to enable uh, private development to come in and take place. Well, we got some additional development in there, but uh, the confidence building measure did not uh, pan out. But what did pan out is three months later when the Korean ambassador called to ask if there was anything we could do to secure the release of the Korean missionaries who were being held hostage by the Taliban. It was this gent that we called upon to take the lead in doing that. And uh, we were able to uh, do that. And maybe in the question and answer session, I can uh, go into some detail on that. Uh, but let me 
One last, last anecdote and then we close. About six months ago, we were having a workshop with uh, 16 madrasa leaders uh, from surrounding the Swat Valley. And at the end of it, one of them stood up. And he was a commander in Lashkari Taiba, which brought you Mumbai and the assassination of Benazir Bhutto. And he said, I came here with one reason, one reason only, and that's to discredit everything you have to say. He says, but after listening to what you had to say, he says, I now find myself filled with rage. Rage because for 26 years I've been reading and teaching the Holy Quran the way I learned it. He says, I, need, and I now see how wrong that was. For the first time in my life, I understand the soul of the Quran and its peaceful intent and the way to advance Islam is through peace, not through conflict. Uh, so that was pretty brave. You lose your head for a lot less up in that area. Uh, but we had had both Frontline and CNN after us for quite some time. So a month later, we took a CNN crew up there, and he said it right on CNN for God and all the world to hear. So this is how courageous these folks are. Once you get past that veneer of hostility and rage and engage them, it's probably their first exercise ever in critical thinking because in a, a very tribally, traditional bound society, there's not much room for that. But they really become champions of this stuff. Uh, let me just close by saying that, uh, you know, just as setting a counterfire is often the most effective antidote for a blaze that's raging out of control, I submit that religious reconciliation has that same potential uh, for religious extremism. In a context in which religious legitimacy trumps all, the best antidote for bad theology is good theology. And this business of making religion part of the solution is, uh, in these uh, intractable conflicts is not uh, without its challenges. It's uh, physically, emotionally, psychologically draining. Uh, and there's uh, more than a little risk involved. Uh, we all know spiritual peacemakers who pay the ultimate price uh, for their efforts. Uh, Gandhi, King, uh, Sadat, Rabin, uh, the list goes on. But I submit that despite the risks and whatever discomfort one may feel in navigating the relatively uncharted waters of spiritual engagement, I think the stakes are simply much too high for us not to give it our best shot. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to take your questions. That's a wonderful, wonderful rendition of the aphorism that there's more power in the open hand than in the clenched fist. And who better to talk about the clenched fist than the nuclear submariner? Uh, and who better to talk about the open hand uh, than Doug with this extraordinary experience he's had with the Muslim community? Faith based diplomacy has a future, and we're so pleased that uh, he's introduced this topic to us. We have about 10 minutes now for some short questions, which I hope you'll preface by saying who you are and that you'll keep it brief. Yes, right here. Uh, I'm Bruce Christensen with the uh, uh, Board of Overseers for the Weekly Institution. And my question goes to the difficulty of reconciling. My question goes to the difficulty of reconciling the United States separation of church and state and religion and how we make progress in that arena in order to foster the kinds of things you're talking about. Well, it's a very, it's a very good question. Uh, I've often said that uh, government officials are uh, really not well equipped to engage in the sort of diplomacy I've been talking about, uh, A, because of the church-state separation hang-up, and also uh, B, because uh, uh, when you represent a government, you uh, inevitably have a political agenda, and uh, it takes away from the balanced neutrality that uh, is often needed. Uh, however, as I said before, uh, General Petraeus uh, has uh, taken a, quite a bit of license uh, on, the, on the church state thing, and uh, even in his briefings before the Congress, on his briefing chart, it says engage religious leaders, you know? And uh, the military really gets this. 
uh, they have to take the hill and they're going to do whatever it takes to take the hill. Uh, the State Department, on the other hand, although uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, resonance uh, with this business uh, at the personal level, institutionally the State Department continues to be uh, strongly bound in its straitjacket of dogmatic secularism. So we've got a long way to go on that. Yes, uh, John Harmer. We haven't tried any husband and wife teams, uh, and this is not a wife, this is a, a speaker that we brought in. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, I didn't get an opportunity because of the shortness of the time, but uh, in taking this to scale, uh, one of the things we're doing is uh, we're training the female leaders of girls' madrasas. Uh, for three years, the women asked us to do so, but the men would have nothing to do with it, so we stayed away from it. Then the men got to the point where they said they wanted the women trained as well. And it gets very difficult in some respects, uh, just the logistics, you know, of letting women go to some place that's away from home and this sort of thing. But uh, they've been forthcoming. And a key thing, the first step we've taken towards uh, going to scale is enlisting the universities in Pakistan. We started with the University of Karachi um, to train the madrasa faculty uh, in a program that can lead to certification. And we've, uh, we're right now, as I speak, we're in our second six-week training program at the University of Karachi. We've also done one at the University of Peshawar, which is up in the radical areas. Uh, and why it's important is because in the past there have been no standards or accountability. If you want to open a madrasa, you open a madrasa. Uh, but uh, now we're introducing quality control into the certification process. And the thing that's, I think, even far more important is that uh, the, this is also bridging the social gap, huge social gap between the madrasas, which on the one hand are isolated, insulated, and feel looked down upon, and most of Pakistani society, including the universities, who in fact do look down upon them. And once these folks walk through the university doors, the feeling of acceptance they, that they have is, uh, it's just monumental. In the first uh, class, we had 29 participants, and they were all the sons or stepsons of the owners of the madrasas surrounding Karachi, which is a pretty volatile area. And uh, so soon they will be calling the shots. But more importantly, they all brought their fathers to the graduation. You know, so I think in the final analysis, at some point, the government of Pakistan is going to need to own its madrasas. The country needs to own its madrasas. The way to do that, to mainstream them, I think, is through the universities. And uh, we feel that this uh, offers a great hope for the future. And the universities bring in the women side. We're, we're doing both, uh, men and the women, yes. Dr. Ross? My name is Jerry Ross, and I, I was very interested. Uh, sorry. Uh, I want to just begin by thanking you, Dr. Johnson, for a most stimulating uh, presentation that is very thought-provoking. Um, I was taken by your comment that you felt that one of the, that your greatest strategic assets was the American Muslim community. And uh, I, my perception is that uh, many people feel that in response to the terrorism uh, associated with uh, uh, sort of extremist Islam, that the, uh, that the moderate community of Muslims in America need to be seen at a higher profile as perhaps disassociating themselves from that, or at least saying that we have an entirely different point of view. Uh, and I wonder if you might expand on that just a little bit as to what efforts might be underway to try to achieve those ends. Sure, that's a very good question. Uh, one of the problems that the American Muslims have, and they've complained about this a lot, is the moderates who are speaking out and want to get recognized and, uh, and heard uh, the only way they can get uh, coverage in the newspapers is by paying for it. Uh, otherwise, it's not deemed to be newsworthy. So there's no fewer than something like 732 fatwas that have been issued 
by American Muslim religious leaders, you know, condemning terrorism and all the rest of it, there is a lot going on out there that we're not hearing about. A fatwa is a religious edict. Yes, a question right here. My name is Joseph Neary, and um, I guess as a student, I was curious as to how uh, students who are interested in this sphere of faith faith diplomacy might get involved. Well, uh, we, uh, we've had a number of students get involved. And by the way, I should just digress for a second and tell you, in this first book, Religion, the Missing Dimension of Statecraft, which is in, as Joe said, its 15th printing, there were two targets. One was the Foreign Service Institute that trains our foreign service officers. It's pretty critical of our foreign service. Uh, but the primary target was universities, colleges, and seminaries, because it's your generation that's going to be able to run with these kinds of ideas. Teaching old dogs like me new tricks is too hard. And, we, and this, this has been pe playing out. We're, that's one of the reasons it's been so many printings. It's, uh, you'll find it in most graduate and undergraduate seminars of an awful lot of the universities that you can name, and seminaries. Um, and we've had uh, a number of uh, university students who've come through as interns and, you know, with, with our program. And, I mean, just this last, we, we we're small and we don't have room for many, but just this last, uh, this summer we had uh, uh, someone from Oxford, uh, Princeton, uh, St. Andrews uh, in Scotland. Um, it was quite a crop of very capable people and they're really enthused about this stuff. I must say too, uh, partly in reaction to some pressure, we brought uh, Luce Foundation, the Henry Luce Foundation in New York. Henry Luce is the one who started Time Magazine. Uh, they have been funding programs in uh, all over the country in prominent universities on religion and foreign policy. So this gets you into it as well. Uh, and they've been very strategic about those uh, schools that they've uh, chosen. Next question, that, wave in the back. We you have to sound off. It's like the other end of the football field. We have seven chaplain candidates here at BYU that will be on the ground over in Afghanistan and Iraq in the next three years. What would you recommend that we do when we get over there? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a third book right at the moment, uh, the working title of which is uh, Religion, Terror, and Error. Uh, U.S. foreign policy and spiritual engagement. And one of the things I try to do in the book is sort of play king for a day and ask myself, if I, if I were leading this country, uh, what assets would I have at my disposal that could be usefully redirect, redirected to uh, help with this problem? And uh, after that, asking what new capabilities need to be uh, developed. Uh, but the first one in terms of existing capabilities are military chaplains who are already ab about church and state, uh, who finesse the battle of the budget because their resource is already in being. And right now, the, uh, the guidance, uh, the latest one is Joint Publication 105, a revision that will come out uh, this month or next uh, that is going to set the ground rules for how chaplains can be used in very effective ways uh, in uh, engaging with uh, local religious leaders, uh, and there's all kinds of wonderful things that can come out of that, uh, but also as serving, uh, serving as the principal advisor to their commands on the religious and cultural aspects of all that's going on. And uh, we had to, I had the pleasure in 2001 of leading a team that instructed all Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard chaplains in religion and statecraft. And the U.S. Navy bought all 1,300 of them, one of these books. And the idea was to try to enhance the conflict prevention capabilities of the sea service commands, which are often at the cutting edge of our overseas involvements, uh, so that uh, chaplains didn't have to just deal with the consequences of conflict after it's taken place, but could perhaps be helpful in preventing it in the first place. So there's just a lot, and there are some good examples. There's lots of vignettes of initiatives that chaplains have taken in Afghanistan and Iraq to great uh, effect. So there's, there's lots to be learned, and if you'd like to, uh, I'll give you my card afterwards. We can communicate, and I can direct you towards some of that stuff. So. We have time for one more student question. Do I have a student out there that's burning with a question? And then a lady. 
All right, the lady here in front. Steve, stand up. <laughs> you're his daughter. <laughs> like he, you're the only one he can get away with saying stand up. <laughs> aspect of the United States support for Israel and, and the antagonism that that um, causes with the Muslim world. It seems like the other thing that, um, a whole, that the United States is held in contempt for is its lack of religiosity and its immorality. So how, um, how effective can the United States be when there's that perception, which in fact is probably true. And the and our in, importation or exportation of some questionable values to those countries. That's a very excellent question because when I'm in the very remote parts of the world, uh, if they even have a television and I turn it on, the chances are better than 50-50 that I get the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> or if not that, then Baywatch. Uh, and this is the cultural image that we're projecting, okay? And we seem totally powerless to do anything about it. You know, I only halfway with tongue in cheek wonder if, uh, you know, it's time for an amendment to the First Amendment. But uh, I will say this, though, uh, pointing back three, three years ago, every year we bring people that we're working with overseas to the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington which involves about three days of activities uh, surrounding the breakfast where the president comes and speaks and so do others. These are sponsored by the House and Senate prayer breakfast groups. And one year I had uh, six uh, people that we brought over and five were Muslims uh, of high stature from both Sudan and Kashmir. And every one of them, every single one of those Muslims afterwards exclaimed how surprised they were how almost shocked they were to, to understand the degree to which uh, religion informed our uh, democratic process. And they felt much better as a result. They felt like they could really relate. And uh, the problem, it, it's not Muslims have with Christians, it's the problem Muslims have with secularists who don't believe, you know, they perceive it's not believing in God. So even when we use the same words, we say secular, they hear godless, and what we meant was freedom to worship as you please. So we, we talk past one another in a lot of this. But it takes a concerted effort. I don't really know what the right answer is going to be on this cultural image projection, because it needs to be addressed. We're projecting stuff that's every bit as offensive to us as it is to them. You know. Well, Doug, you've informed us, you've inspired us. Thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you.